Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start today's webinar. First and foremost, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Ryan Jones, and I, I'm the Associate for Communications and Partnerships here at Education for DC. We're excited to share a little bit about more about ourselves and our work with everyone joining today. Before we begin, if anyone finds themselves having technical issues with today's webinar, please use the chat feature to contact us, and we will work with you to try, try to resolve any issues. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Education for DC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing quality and equity in DC's public schools. We launched in 2016, and in our first five years, our goal is to double the number of underserved students in Washington, DC, who are college and career ready, with a particular focus on at-risk and special education students. We made strategic investments in four areas, schools, human capital, public engagement, and advocacy. Today's webinar is meant to give you a better understanding of who we are, how to seek funding from us, and what a partnership with Education for DC looks like. We have about an hour together, and we plan to, one, review Education for DC's mission and goals, mission and model, excuse me, two, describe Education for DC's funding strategy, and lastly, describe our grant making process. We'll leave time at the end for our Q&A section. I want to let everyone know that they can submit questions throughout our time together, but we will save the last five minutes of the webinar for our Q&A portion. You can use the chat feature to submit any questions or let us know if you are having technical issues with the webinar. If you have any remaining questions after today, you can reach out to info at ed4dc.org and we'll make sure your question gets, gets directed to the right person. A recording of this webinar will also be available on our website and we will be sending out to everyone that registered for the event via email. Before we go further, I'd like to introduce my colleagues joining us today. In addition to myself, we have Maura Marino, Chief Executive Officer, BC Oyudele, partner of our Schools and Human Capital Investments, Fonda Sutton, partner of our Public Engagement Investments, and Margie Yeager, partner of our Advocacy Investments. Now I'm going to turn it over to Maura, who gives, will give us an or overview of our history and our funding model. Maura? Thanks, Ryan. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. We're really thrilled that you're taking the time this morning uh, to learn more about our work, and we're looking forward in particular to your questions. So please think about those along the way. Feel free to chat us during the session as questions come up, and we will make sure to get to as many of those as possible uh, at the end. Um, so as Ryan said, I'm gonna start with sort of a, a broad overview of our um, mission and our work, um, but I wanna start by introducing myself. Um, I've lived in D.C. for about 10 years and have been on the Education Forward D.C. team since we launched about two and a half years ago. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast, but I started my career as a high school teacher in California. Um, and then after teaching, um, joined the team of a national grant-making organization called New Schools Venture Fund. And for me, um, the reason I got involved in this work and, and got into teaching and eventually into grant making is because I benefited from incredible public schools in the community I grew up in. I had teachers who were deeply invested in my success, who knew me personally, um, and who encouraged me along the way. Um, and what I realized was that um, the opportunities I had in public school and the, the commitment we've made to our children that um, everybody uh, has the right to a great public education was playing out really differently um, with peers that I knew, folks that I met playing sports in high school, um, when I went to college and started tutoring in the local community. And so um, that for me was um, why I started uh, getting involved. And here in DC, I have the chance to meet incredibly talented young people every day um, who have passions and great ideas about how to, uh, how they wanna make an impact in the world. Um, and I think we need public schools that are really worthy of them that cultivate those passions and help them feel set up for their future. So I feel really lucky to be doing this work, especially with this team. So now I'm gonna talk about our mission and our model. Um, as Ryan mentioned earlier, we're a grant-making organization, and our mission is to accelerate the work of visionary education leaders to foster a city of high-quality, equitable public schools for every DC student and family. And specifically, in our first five years, our goal is to double the number, number of underserved students in DC who are college and career ready. And that term underserved gets used a lot, so I wanna share a little bit more what we mean when we say underserved. 
We're talking about students who are classified by the city as at risk of academic failure um, and students who qualify for special education services. And the slide you're looking at now has a little bit of data behind those classifications. So this is specifically looking at the percent of students who qualify for a special education need of an individual education plan, um, and also our students who are at risk. And you'll notice on the right side of the slide um, is a list of the factors that the city considers uh, in terms of which students are at risk. These are students whose families qualify for welfare or food stamps, students who are homeless or in the foster care system, and high school students who are at least a year over age and undercredited. And together, these students make up 55% of our, student, our public school student population in DC. So it's a significant number of students, and we feel it's really essential um, to focus on these students. As many of you know, DC has made significant improvements in its public education system and public schools, particularly in the last decade since mayoral control was implemented in DC. However, we're still very far from the promise of a high quality public school for every student. And again, here's some data behind uh, what I mean when I say that. In 2018, only 33% of all students in the city reached what's considered a college and career ready level on our citywide exam, which is called the PARC exam, the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. But what was even more striking is that only 18% of our at-risk students were classified as on track for college and career success, and only 6% of our special education students. You also see on this slide that we have a very significant black-white achievement gap and that our Hispanic students, um, there's a significant gap for our Hispanic students. And so um, we feel we have a lot of work to do, um, and you'll hear about it today in terms of our strategy, to build schools that are really designed not for the average student, but for the students who are furthest from opportunity. We don't think we'll happen upon um, a type of school model that works for everyone if we aim at the middle. So we think if we're intentional about the kinds of schools we have in our city, um, particularly for students who are more vulnerable, that we will create models that actually work well for students across the spectrum. Um, in order to do this work, um, our model is a three-part approach. The first is to raise money from individuals and from foundations and to provide it in grants to nonprofit organizations with aligned missions who are focused on the same work. The second part of our model is that once we make a grant, um, we are a hands-on funder, so we provide strategic and advisory support to our grantees. And then the third part of our model is to help coordinate and align efforts across the city. Um, I, I know everyone on this call um, has some kind of connection to public education in DC or, or an interest in it, and so I think you already know that there are so many people working incredibly hard every day in our city on behalf of our young people. And we think there's room to organize and coordinate those efforts in a way that we can have even more impact together. So that's what this third part of our model is really about. In order to reach our goal over the next five years, um, which again is to double the number of underserved students who are college and career ready, we're making grants in four areas. School, human capital, public engagement, and advocacy. So now you'll have a chance to hear more from the folks on our team who lead each area um, of that work. And then um, after they share, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, if you're interested in getting involved um, and being considered for a grant, what that process looks like. So now I'm going to turn it over to BC, who's going to talk about our schools and human capital work. Thank you, Maura. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ryan, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is BC Oyedele, and I'm the partner managing our schools and human capital investments. Um, and how I got involved in education uh, really um, is as a result of the belief that um, education is the only tried and true uh, way to actually transform and improve outcomes for historically marginalized communities. Both as a first generation immigrant to this country, as someone who grew up in poverty, I feel as if I am a living testament to that particular belief and idea. Um, and so that sort of uh, logic guided my decisions to be a public school teacher, guided my decision to be the leader of both Catholic and charter schools, and most recently, before joining the Education for DC team, I was um, at the Lynch Leadership Academy in Boston, uh, housed in Boston College, providing support to principals and those who are aspiring to be principals, as well as districts, uh, charter management organizations, and Catholic schools 
that had interest in developing their uh, human capital and talent strategies. Um, and so um, as a parent of a DC uh, public school student now, um, this work is extremely important to me. So talking a little bit about our school's strategy more specifically, I'll give you an overview of our five-year goals, uh, and then I'll start talking a little bit about our human capital strategy and investments as well. Our five-year goal on our school strategy is to fund the growth or redesign of 35 schools, which will create 14,000 high-quality seats when, that's, when those schools are fully enrolled. We also provide, as Mara mentioned, strategic support to schools and organizations that we partner with in the hopes of supporting their efforts to drive better outcomes for all students and establish deep and meaningful partnerships to improve quality and families and community, to improve quality in our schools while also partnering deeply and meaningfully with communities and family stakeholders. All of this is um, in support of an effort to foster a diverse citywide portfolio of schools that are truly responsive to students and families' needs. Um, we fund four school types in particular, local charter schools that are looking to expand their reach in the city, national charter networks that have been recruited to D.C., new schools starting in D.C. for the first time, school restarts or charter management organizations assuming operations for existing struggling schools in the hopes of better meeting student needs. We are also interested in funding organizations that can meaningfully provide support to schools in their quest to strengthen outcomes for students with disabilities and students who've been designated as at risk. An example of two of our previous investments include Statesman College Preparatory Academy for Boys Public Charter School, which is a new school created to develop a school environment that reimagines, redesigns, and recreates the student experience for black and brown boys. We also recently provided DCPS with a grant to support the launch of Bard Early College High School DC which will be a partnership school between Bard College and their Early College Network, as well as DCPS or District of Columbia Public Schools. Moving forward, uh, we want to continue to fund schools that fit in the aforementioned school types, namely new schools, existing local schools looking to increase their impact, national charter management organizations looking to expand to DC, and restart or school management transfer opportunities. In addition, we are also interested in funding opportunities that can improve schools' ability to increase the academic performance for students with disabilities and students deemed at risk in schools. Currently, we do not provide grants that support the ongoing operations of schools that are fully enrolled. While we believe in the value of partnerships, we also do not provide grants that support the acquisition of curriculum materials or after school programs in schools. And finally, we do not provide grants to support infant and toddler programs exclusively or grants to higher education organizations. I'll now transition to talking a little bit about our human capital strategy and our investments. Our human capital strategy aims to ensure that DC schools have the high quality teachers and school leaders that every student deserves. The five year goals for our human capital investments are as follows. Support programs that recruit and develop teachers to add an additional 450 high quality teachers per year. Fund leadership development programs for school leaders to ensure that high quality Diverse talent is available to sustain 50 high quality schools. And then fund opportunities to proliferate practices that will lead to improved retention of our teachers and our leaders. In short, our grants are focused on growing teacher and leader pipelines and we support organizations that train teachers and develop leaders. In order to help schools build cultures and environments that allow educators to thrive, we also focus our efforts on building effective talent management practices from recruitment and training to high quality professional de development and retention. Our human capital grantees include Relay Graduate School of Education, a national teacher preparation program to bring their teacher residency program to DC, and School Leader Lab to launch and train and support instructional leaders here in Washington, DC. Since its founding in 2017, Relay DC has trained over 100 teachers to lead and support our students. And since the initial school leader cohort in 2017, School Leader Lab has trained over 40 school leaders. Moving forward, we continue to look for ways to recruit, develop, and retain teachers and school leaders. Um, at present, we do not support ongoing operational costs for schools or human capital organizations. If you have any questions or you just generally like more clarification after today's webinar on what we do and what we do not fund, or are interested in partnering with us for our schools or human capital work, you can contact me at boyadele at n4dc.org, and my information will also be available at the end of this webinar. At this point, I'd like to introduce Fonda Sun, who leads our public engagement work. Fonda. Thank you, BC. My name is Fonda Sutton, and as BC mentioned, I manage our public engagement investments. I spent my entire career working in the public education sector here in the District of Columbia, 
first as the co-founder of two charter schools and later as a policy and legislative advisor at the state and district level. Through all of this work, I think I've learned the value of developing and maintaining strong partnerships and trusting that stakeholders bring critical insight and really practical solutions to the challenges we face in our communities. I live in the city for over 30 years. It's a city that I love and I continue to love this work for many reasons, but mainly because I believe in the brilliance and potential of the young people in the city and their families and communities. I view my current work as a funding decision maker at Education Forward DC as a powerful lever for getting them the great schools that they deserve. Because we know we cannot serve students well without the engagement of their families, our public engagement investments are focused on amplifying the voices of families and community stakeholders in education decision making. We have a three-pronged five-year strategy for public engagement to build the capacity of families and the public to meaningfully engage and influence decision making at the school, sector, and city level, to build the capacity of schools and government to meaningfully engage families and the public, and to gather and share information to support citywide and school level policy and planning decisions. With those as our priority areas for funding, I think I can say a little bit more about the why and how we're funding those priority areas. We believe that the great schools we want for our students should reflect the needs and interests of those students and their families. Our public engagement investments are designed to generate a better fit for those interests by generating the information they need to navigate the really wide-ranging education experience and supporting them in understanding that, inform that information in a way that enables them to effectively contribute. We also support efforts designed to strengthen the work that our schools want to be doing to frame and manage their relationships with families and communities. In the end, the creation of clear, meaningful channels for families to offer feedback and ideas will accelerate our progress toward establishing the high quality schools we want for all students. Over the past two years, the public engagement portfolio has supported the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, OSI, in the development of the DC School Report Card, which was just released this past December. The DC School Report Card is a source of information for families to learn more about their current schools and their school options as they navigate the education system. It also allows policymakers to assess and compare schools across the city, and it will help them make better decisions and inform planning for schools across the city. This is a particularly exciting investment for us because our support helps OSU to conduct a robust, parent-driven design and content development process that captured parents and other stakeholders' feedback on that report card. We believe this has helped to build stakeholder acceptance of the tool. Now, uh, for the first time, our city's education stakeholders have a tool at their disposal that allows them to make apples to apples comparisons of schools across sectors and across the city's neighborhoods. We've also recently supported Black Swan Academy, an organization that works to empower black youth in underserved communities in DC. We've seen Black Swan support some really strong advocacy in young people at the local council, at the State Board of Education, and in their school communities. We view these kinds of opportunities to elevate student voice as a critical element of building family capacity to engage. We know that in some cases, older high school and middle school students are making important decisions about their school choices and they know best what works for them in their schools. Ultimately, engaging more students represents a way to effectively engage their parents and communities. Beyond these investments in great schools and efforts to include students' voice in education decision-making, we see a need to accelerate our progress on building family and community capacity to engage with schools. We're really interested in supporting efforts to increase the knowledge and understanding of parents 
across all neighborhoods of how the education system is designed and how it is and should be working for them. We would be interested in supporting any approaches that support parent and community members' ability to meaningfully participate in and lead the work of building great schools for their communities. As with our other investment areas, we're particularly interested in supporting work driven by leaders of color and leaders with deep knowledge of the communities where this work is most needed. Since our investments are designed to create systemic changes in DC, we do not fund individual projects that won't scale over time. For example, we don't fund school-based parent organizations or specific programs within schools. If you have any questions or just generally would like more clarification after today's webinar on what we do and do not fund, or you're interested in partnering with Education Forward DC with our public engagement efforts, you can reach me via email at fonda at edforwarddc.org. I'll now turn to my friend and colleague, Major Margie Yeager, who leads our advocacy portfolio. Thanks, Fonda. My name is Margie Yeager, and I lead our advocacy investments, which are focused on supporting conditions for high-quality schools that advance equity with a particular focus on underserved students. I come to this work having spent almost two decades in education, both locally and nationally, and ex am extremely passionate about education in D.C. I began my career as a second grade teacher in D.C. public schools and have worked in education ever since, including in the DCPS central office and in the deputy mayor for education's office. I believe deeply in advancing equity and opportunity for students, and I've seen the incredible potential of students all across the city when we give them access to excellent educational opportunities. I also care deeply about this work because my oldest two sons are in D.C. public schools. In advocacy, we have four major elements um, aligned to our goals. Efficient and equitable allocation of resources, strong accountability, autonomy, and equity. Specifically, we want all schools to have the resources that they need, including funding, facilities, and services to meet students' needs. We believe that public schools must be accountable with transparent data to inform parents and that decision making should be done by those who best understand student needs. And finally, we have a strong commitment to equity and want to ensure that there are policies and structures in place to ensure that we're serving all students well. We're excited by the progress that's been made over the past decade, but recognize that there's still an incredible amount of work to be done to ensure that all students receive excellent educational opportunities. To do so, we invest in a range of organizations that are working to mobilize stakeholders to push for policies and practices that will accelerate improvement in quality that all our students and families deserve. Our advocacy investments support success in our other three investment areas, ensuring a great school for all students that is led by excellent principals and has great teachers in a school system that's designed for and with DC families. One of our recent advocacy investments was in PAVE, Parents Amplifying Voices in Education. PAVE is a DC-based nonprofit that connects, informs, and empowers parent leaders to give families in DC a voice and choice in the vision for education in our city. We also funded the DC Policy Center, a nonpartisan research organization that provides independent data and policy analysis to help put every child in DC on the path to success. We're continuing to identify individuals and organizations that have great ideas about how to advance our advocacy work by mobilizing and empowering stakeholders. We're especially interested in supporting leaders of color. Overall, we're seeking to make investments that are going to have systemic impact in DC, and we do not fund individual projects that will scale over time. Also, we only fund 501c3 work, which means we do not fund lobbying, political campaigns, or politicians. If you're interested in partnering with us for our advocacy work, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to me at, via email at margie at edforwarddc.org. I'm really excited to connect with folks with great ideas. I'm gonna turn it back over to Maura now who will give more insight into our grant making process. Thanks, Margie. Um, and thanks everyone for hanging in on the phone. Um, I'm gonna talk through our grant making process um, and then um, we're gonna be getting to your questions in just a few minutes. So. If you haven't already submitted a question, um, please start submitting those um, and thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, so the slide you're looking at now is an overview of our grant-making process, which starts for looking for grantees. 
Um, and then we go through a process where we screen uh, potential grantees against our criteria. Um, folks that move forward then enter a due diligence process um, before we finally make a grant decision. Um, and so in terms of how this cycle plays out, um, we are proactively seeking leaders and organizations that are aligned to the strategies that you just heard about. And we find folks by reading about their work, by learning from folks locally, by hearing what's worked in other places, um, and by meeting people through events and through partners. We want to make sure that we're expanding our, our network and the folks we know and to make sure that we're more widely known to a more diverse network. And we want to be more accessible to potential grantees. And so today is one part of that. We hope that um, this has been helpful to you so far in learning a bit more about us. And we hope that um, you'll reach out to us or you'll encourage others that you know um, to reach out to us. If you have an organization that you think we should get to know, please, please send those ideas our way. In particular, we place a priority on supporting leaders and organizations that are run by leaders of color and leaders who have experiences similar to those who attend public schools in DC. We don't have a specific application cycle and we're always interested in pursuing conversations about promising ideas. You've already heard the contact information um, from each of our strategy leads and I just wanna encourage you again to reach out to those folks. Um, you're really welcome to contact us at any time. Um, and we'll also make sure to disseminate those email addresses again after this webinar. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can also always contact us at info at edforwarddc.org. Um, so once we've um, heard about some of those great ideas in that first step, um, then we enter a screening process, which generally is a phone call um, with the, the leadership of an organization and also reviewing documents like a website or if the organization has sent us any materials, we review all of those before getting on the phone. After that, we move forward with a small number of organizations who have the highest alignment to our criteria. And that's where we enter this next phase of the process, which is due diligence. Um, and so I wanna talk through the criteria um, for making a decision. Um, there's five criteria that we use, which you can see now on your screen. The first is alignment to our strategy. And the question there is, does this organization fit with the strategies in one of the four grant making areas that you just heard about? We look at the program model, and there what we wanna understand is that the organization has an approach rooted in evidence that's likely to yield strong outcomes for underserved students. We look at the market and whether there's a need for the service that the organization is offering and also how it fits with other organizations already doing work in DC. We wanna make sure that um, the work is complementary um, to things that are, are already happening or that if there's a local organization already doing the work that's well positioned to do more, that we're prioritizing supporting that work. Another criteria is the team. And there we're looking at whether the organization has a mission aligned team um, that is positioned well to deliver on its strategy. Um, we look at both the, the leadership team, the broader team at the organization, and the board of the organization in that category. And finally, financial sustainability. And there we're looking at whether the organization has a plan to be sustainable over the long run so it can continue to deliver results for students. So we look at that in our screening process um, and in our due diligence process. And the due diligence process is generally about six to eight weeks. And it includes interviews with staff, with board members, and with other stakeholders. So for example, in the case of a school, it might involve conversations with students or parents. Um, in the case of an advocacy group, it might involve interviews with um, partners in the advocacy coalition that that advocacy organization is involved with. It also involves collection and analysis of organizational documents. Um, so looking at um, if the organization has goals for the year or a budget or a strategy document that they want to share, an org chart, um, we would look at that. Um, we do an analysis of market trends and demand. And what that means is, for example, in the case of a school, um, if somebody has a really compelling school idea, we want to understand if it's something that students and families are really seeking out as a school model um, and whether the school is likely to, to be able to um, get enrolled um, with the idea that they have. Um, <coughs> and then there's a discussion along the way about the size and the form of the grant. Um, is it a contract? Is it a grant letter? Um, and also any goals or milestones that we might um, set together. 
And we know that that process can be really arduous and time consuming for folks. And so our hope is that the process is informative and helpful to you in achieving your mission. Um, whether we end up working together or not, we want to be really respectful and, and hopefully um, provide helpful context for the work you're doing. We want the process to allow both you and us to assess mutual fit for partnerships. So certainly you can see that we're really digging in and trying to build our understanding of an organization's work. Um, we also help the, hope that those organizations are doing their homework about us and figuring out if we're actually a good fit as a partner. It's, it's certainly a two-way street. And finally, our hope is that the process doesn't disrupt your work on behalf of students in DC. Um, being in the fundraising um, business ourselves, we know that um, these processes sometimes can um, be time consuming and we wanna make sure that you're able to focus on the most important work that you're doing every day. Um, so I'm now gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Ryan Jones, who's gonna facilitate a Q&A session and address any of the topics that we might not have covered so far. Cool, thank you, Maura. Maura, so like she said, we're in the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, we're answering questions that we that you said throughout the webinar, and if you don't have to see your question was answered, you can feel free to contact us at info at ed4dc.org, or you can reach out to the individual strategy lead who uh, shared the contact information, and you can also see their contact information on the screen. My colleague, Erin Sheehy, is going to go ahead and read your great questions that you shared throughout the webinar. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yes, thank you for the great questions. Keep them coming. Um, in the order that we receive the questions, our first question is, are you looking to partner with schools, only with schools? I have a nonprofit organization that promotes education and literacy. Yeah, so um, that sounds fantastic uh, and definitely would love to have further conversation and learn more about your work. Um, but at the moment, we are focused solely on funding uh, schools and not school, not organizations that are partnering with schools, unless those organizations are partnering to potentially provide um, strategic support to schools in their pursuit of improving outcomes for special education students or at-risk students. Thanks, BC. Um, next question, are you supporting after-school organizations that work closely with DC public and charter schools in support of students on time advancement, high school graduation, and college enrollment? Um, so, no, unfortunately, we are not uh, directly funding those organizations. Again, we believe that work is vital and critical um, and are always happy to have conversations with folks who are doing work on behalf of DC schools, but at the moment, we are not funding those organizations. Another question, and this question is about the three-part model. Uh, for the second aspect of your model, providing strategic and advisory support, do you work with external partners? For example, do you have strategic partners who might provide consulting, evaluation, or other types of support for your grantees? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we approach that with a mix of strategies. Um, we certainly um, don't think that we uh, can provide all of the expertise that our grantees um, need in many cases. Um, and so we work together with the grantee to figure out what the most critical issues are that they want to focus on, let's say, in the coming year. And then there may be a few places where we can provide some direct support or advice, um, but generally speaking, um, we connect them with organizations that might be more helpful. So um, we work with a lot of teacher prep organizations that are thinking really hard about how to measure their progress um, in supporting teachers. And that is not an area in which we are experts, but we might introduce them to another organization that's tackled a similar problem um, or to an organization that we know of that has some expertise in measurement. Um, and then they might use our grant dollars um, in order to, to do that evaluation and measurement work. So most of it is um, introductions and connections, um, but there is some of it that is um, direct uh, advice or support we might provide um, along the way. Thanks, Norm. Um, next question. The Walton Foundation grant page mentions Education Forward as a partner. Are Walton Grants and Ed Forward Grants the same, or are they separate entities? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so the Walton Foundation is its own organization, so I can't speak on their behalf, but they are one of our supporters. Um, and so when we receive funds from the Walton Foundation, um, we use them across the areas that you heard described today. Um, we've gotten some specific questions over time about school startup grants, so I will just touch on that um, briefly in case that's 
part of the question. Um, the Wallen Foundation does have a school startup program. Um, we also provide school startup grants directly. Um, and there are um, ways that the Walton team manages that. And if you have questions, we're happy to get you in touch with those folks to figure out whether you should be talking to us or talking to the Walton team about school startup. Um, but we are separate organizations. Next question. Upon application, is it preferential that the organization has done legwork in determining a specific ward and or facility for location? Is it beneficial to already have an active 501c3 that's in good standing? That sounds like a school question. Like 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, is it helpful if you have a facility? Sure, I'm sure it would be helpful to you in general, but it's not necessarily material to our own diligence process. Um, we're happy to have a conversation while you're still trying to figure out where the best location for the school might be. Um, by and large, uh, we're interested in supporting uh, individuals with great ideas. Um, we think that they can materially produce um, outcomes for the students that we talked about. So you do not need to have those things secured. As far as the 501c3, that's not necessary for our own application process as well. Next question, what role do you feel as forward can play to ensure strong cross-sector collaboration in the district? Um, Sonia and Margie, do you guys want to start on that one since it's connected to all of our work yeah. but connects to public engagement and advocacy? I think we've both thought about um, how to engage parents of, um, of students in both sectors. And so when I think about my investments, I am thinking a lot about building um, sort of citywide conversations um, uh, with parents. Um, a lot of times in some families, um, they may have children who are one attending a charter school and one, is, uh, one attending a DC public school. Um, and we also um, are thinking about the data that parents can use, um, as I mentioned before, to compare um, schools across both sectors. Um, I think that parents care um, a lot less than, than some may think about the sector a school fits in. And we're really, really um, focused on engaging them to figure out how to make schools great across both sectors. I would just echo that, what my colleague Fonda says. Um, when we think about the challenges in education in our city, they are not unique to one sector. Um, we still have a lot of work to do, both in DCPS and in the public charter schools, to improve and see the kind of excellent and equitable outcomes we want for all students. And so from an advocacy perspective, we are really thinking in a cross-sector way about how do we push for uh, policies and practices that will lead to improved outcomes in both sectors. And we're really um, thinking about organizations um, either in one sector or the other, or that are thinking across both sectors about how they can really help advance um, conversations and policies that will support that equity that we're seeking. So we think in a very cross-sector way, we're very open to funding organizations that are focused on either sector or in a, with a cross-sector approach. Thank you. Um, next question. Do you have a minimum budget requirement for organizations applying through the advocacy track? Uh, no, we don't have a minimum. So I would encourage folks who have a compelling idea, have an organization that, that is already in existence, to please reach out and let's have a conversation because there is no specific minimum. This kind of connects to the conversation DC, uh, <laughs> that DC spoke to a minute ago about um, being uh, whether you need a 501c3, but we have worked with folks who are individuals who don't have an organization or a budget. They, they have an idea and um, a compelling set of reasons why they believe that idea will make a difference for young people. And we've also worked with organizations that are more mature but might be um, launching a new area of their work or expanding in some way or a school that's um, seeking to reach more students. So we really work with people across a spectrum, so don't let that hold you back from reaching out. Next question. We are an experiential learning nonprofit organization that works solely with Title I schools in D.C. Our work is done during the school day. We also have a year-long teacher fellowship that trains teachers in experiential learning through the lenses of trauma sensitivity, racial equity, and SEL. Do you fund this type of work? Okay, so that definitely sounds very interesting, and we should um, have a conversation for sure. I think we're very interested in learning more about um, how schools are uh, providing trauma-informed practices uh, for students. 
Um, obviously, we're, we're very concerned with academic outcomes for uh, the underserved students that we've mentioned. And so this work does sound potentially interesting and in align with our, our strategy. So we should certainly have a conversation. You should reach out to me so we can talk further. Next question. For launching a new school, when it comes to the criteria of team, what if I do not yet have all of the team members, i.e. leadership team members, board members, et cetera? Receiving funding will support me with focusing full time on planning the details of my school, cultivating membership of leaders and board members, and preparing the charter applications for the PTSD, et cetera. Yeah. Lisa, you're on the hot seat again. Another question for me. This is great. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think we, def uh, we consider all those factors. We recognize that uh, starting a school is no small task uh, and early stage support is critical. And so part of our initial conversation is just understanding the idea and how it can best be helpful. In some instances, that could also mean connecting you with other partners who do more intensive work with organizations that are looking to start schools for the first time. So we should, at the first, just start having a conversation and discuss the idea, discuss how far along you're thinking you might be, discuss your potential timeline for submitting an application, and discuss who the potential partners might be that, be able, that will be able to support that work. So I think the first step is just to reach out and let's schedule a time to talk and, and discuss the idea further. Somewhat related question. Um, are there funding opportunities for individuals with innovative ideas? Sorry, just off my screen. Who are interested in starting nonprofits aligned to your goals? Well, I think <laughs> as it, uh, starting on topics, I, I mean, obviously, within the context of my portfolio, um, both or I guess all of those uh, human capital organizations are nonprofits, right? So the Relay Graduate School of Education, um, the uh, excuse me, the uh, School Leader Lab. So yes, you know, we would obviously have conversations about um, supporting that work, uh, supporting organizations that are interested in um, starting nonprofits. Obviously, that looks different across investment areas, but. From, from my perspective, if you have an idea that's promising, if you want to start a new idea, or if you want to start an organization that's going to materially contribute to the goals that we've set forth, um, I think the first step is to have a conversation and explore further about whether or not there's um, uh, an opportunity to partner. And I, I, oh, go ahead, Bonnie. Yeah, PAVE is an example of an, uh, of an idea, um, and we were able to support um, uh, that promising concept through the entrepreneur's um, study and travel and, um, um, building up, out the concept over over time, um, so we do have that as, as a track record. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I, I think it can be really hard to think about making the leap into entrepreneurship. I think we've all um, worked with people who uh, might be doing something, you know, full time in their day job, but have a passion project on the side or an idea that's been in the back of their head for a while, but you're not sure how to get it started. Um, and we're happy to talk about what that path looks like, how to make it less risky for you to think about um, going down that road. Um, and as Fonda mentioned, we have examples of how we've tried to help folks to have a period to learn and explore um, a high potential idea um, to make it a little bit safer to, to decide to go in that direction of launching a new organization. We have a question about scope of what we fund. You mentioned you don't specifically fund infant and toddler programs. Does that include advocacy efforts, especially around transition services for parents with children receiving special education services? There's actually a continuation of this question a little bit. Later. Specifically a training program that prepares daycare families to be effective advocates as their children move into preschool and K-12 and may need continued special ed services. Sure. That's a great question. So I, I think it's definitely worth a follow-up conversation. While our focus for schools is not in the early childhood space, we're definitely very interested in how we can help support parents become strong advocates for their children in K-12, especially parents of students uh, with disabilities. So I, I'd certainly welcome a follow-up conversation to learn a little bit more about the work. Uh, a question about eligibility. Do you need to be physically located in D.C. to qualify? No, you don't need to be physically located in D.C. Um, I think it would, in, in terms of likelihood of getting a grant, it would largely depend um, what the work is you're trying to do. So if you're trying to run a school in D.C. and you live in Iowa, that might be hard. Um, so we'd want to learn more about that. Um, but there's no residency requirement, it's, and we certainly work with organizations that are based in one place um, but are uh, building a team in D.C. 
Another question. Our program is an early literacy intervention that combines tutoring with family engagement with proven results that both increase literacy skills and impact school day attendance. Is there an opportunity to partner? Yeah, I think um, just based on that description, again, we can certainly have further conversation, but it doesn't exactly sound like it's aligned to the goals that we've sort of laid out uh, over the course of this webinar. Um, we're focused on supporting uh, new schools that are hoping to start or um, existing schools that are hoping to expand their footprint, um, charter management organizations that are hoping to relocate to D.C. or opportunities to support schools that are struggling um, with the transition to another charter management organization. And I think our focus is specifically on trying to understand if there are technical assistance providers that can support academic outcomes for underserved students. Um, and that bucket is, is, is work that's pretty critical and oftentimes can look different uh, depending on who we're talking to. So um, while literacy is obviously a critical component of school and, and academic outcomes, um, a specific uh, program that's focused on literacy as a curriculum is not a program that we would potentially uh, partner with. Um, we have a question about the grant sizes. Um, what's the range of grants you provide? Um, what's the average size of your grants? And do you give multi-year grants? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so yes, we give multi-year grants. Um, our grant sizes range, and I would say the average is different um, in each of the investment areas that was described. Um, on the low end, I would say our grants tend to start around $50,000, um, and on the high end, they're upwards of a million dollars. Um, the grants to schools tend to be larger than grants to other kinds of organizations, but I would say on average, um, probably our average is somewhere about $250,000 across all of our grant-making organizations, but that's skews higher in schools and lower in human capital advocacy and public engagement. We have a question from Margie. Um, the question is, how are you working with DC policymakers and politicians to ensure alignment with your advocacy efforts? It's a great question. So um, we try to engage with a wide variety of um, DC policymakers and leaders um, in an education capacity to help raise the issue and challenges that we see in schools, um, help inform their thinking, and uh, encourage policies that are aligned with really advancing improvements for students and equity. Um, that includes engaging um, with a variety of uh, leadership in DC public schools and the public charter school board, the state board of education, the city council, um, a wide variety of city leaders, the deputy mayor for education, um, all of those who play a really important role in shaping policy in the city. Thanks, Margie. Um, a question about um, timelines. What's the timeline generally from screening of a grant to making a decision on a grant? Yeah, <clears throat> um, there's a big range. So I would say if the, the shortest timeline um, would be about eight weeks. Um, as I mentioned, that diligence process itself is something like six to eight weeks, and that would be sort of the fastest cycle. Um, but often there's organizations um, or people that we might meet who, as I said, are, are doing something as sort of a side interest that um, might be on our radar, but they might not be ready to um, uh, get into really thinking about it as an organization for several years in some cases. So um, that, that timeline really can vary um, based on where the organization is, based on our strategic priorities, um, and just based on capacity to go through that diligence process on both sides. Do you provide grants to organizations doing work in the Prince George's County, or do you only fund organizations working in D.C.? We only fund organizations whose work is focused on D.C. students. Um, we don't have any other questions, although one um, one question that has come up repeatedly is whether we'll share the deck, and the answer is yes, we will share the deck and the recording of this webinar after the webinar. Sounds great. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Maura, who's going to close us out for today. And again, thank you all for joining us. Yeah, I just want to echo Ryan's thanks. We know you're all really busy people. Um, you have a lot on your plate, so thank you for taking some time. Uh, to be with us for this webinar today, or if you're watching it on video later, um, thank you for um, your interest. Um, again, please feel free to contact, contact us via email. You can see our emails right now on your screen. We'll also send them out to you um, after this. As Erin mentioned, we'll be sending the materials along if you want to take some time to look through those on your own. You can also sign up 
uh, for our blog on our website, um, which is edforwarddc.org. Um, or you can follow us on social media at, at edforwarddc. We are on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, <laughs> and Twitter. Um, so please get to know us via social media. And we'd love your feedback on whether or not this webinar was helpful. This was our first time doing a webinar like this. Um, and so we would love um, if you would fill out the survey we're going to send you in just a few minutes and let us know um, what worked, what didn't work, what we could do differently next time. Um, I want to thank my team um, for being part of this conversation today. And again, thank all of you um, for the time you've taken. Uh, and we look forward to hearing your questions and to hearing about all of the great ideas that you have um, that we can be working on together on behalf of our city's young people. So thanks so much and take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye.